If you would, turn with me to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. And I want to read verses 11 through 14 for now. Matthew, uh, Matthew 15, verse 11. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my fa heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. Amen. Our Lord here speaks specifically here of the Pharisees that had just heard what he said. Up at the, I think the first verse, it says the scribes and the Pharisees. And came to Jesus, the scribes and Pharisees. The disciples wanted to make sure that the Lord knew the Pharisees were offended by what he said. Can you imagine that? Yeah. We like to help God out, don't we? Jesus Christ's response is this. God knows them that are his because he put them where he wants them. Yes, if they are not one of his, God will take care of them in his own ordained time. Yes, he then tells them what we read here about those who want to clean the outside of the cup while the inside is full of dead man's bones. What does he tell us about those like this? Let them alone. Yes. This is a strong command. Yes, sir. Our Lord means for us to leave those who are like this alone. Why? They are blind leaders. Yeah. They cannot see Christ. Christ himself tells us they are blind. They cannot see Christ, and in not seeing Christ, then they are not able to point men and women to Christ and His truth and His gospel. All they can see is flesh, works of the flesh. So we see here that there are some who are blind, and those who follow them are blind. The result of this union is both will fall into the ditch. Yes, that is a hole. And I can't help but think of the scriptures that speak of the hole of the pit, that grave, when I read this here. But the end of these will be death unless God turns them. Yes, sir. <clears throat> what is it that those who are blind do not like to hear? I, I want to look at the following things. The speech of the blind, or what is it that those talk about who are blind? And what is the speech that the blind do not like? What is the real problem? And the re remedy for that problem. <clears throat> this chapter starts out with the Pharisees talking about their creeds, verses 1 and 2. Yeah. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat. <clears throat> <clears throat> the word here for tradition in Matthew 15 means precept, law, or ordinance. The word creed means a set of beliefs or aims which guide someone's actions. We have these Pharisees with us today. They are not all Jewish either. Yeah, you're right. They hold to their traditions above the word because they always go to the creed instead of the word. They did this here as well as well because our Lord tells us this. If the creed says what scripture says, why do we need the creed? Why don't we use scripture? The reason is it does not fully and completely say what the scripture says in most cases. I'm not saying that there's not some good things in them that agree with scripture. But they are man-made, so they are flawed. If they were used as a, a writing of man and judged based on Scripture, then that's fine. But these blind leaders of the blind do not use them this way. 
It is their guide on how, how they are to live in this world. It is of the flesh. God's word is not flawed. I remember what a preacher said about this before. They say that they have creeds as a summary of what, uh, what they believe about God's word. We are told in scripture that the Bible does not even contain all there is to know about Jesus Christ. It says there would not even be enough books in the world to contain it all. So the Spirit of God summarized His Word. Why does man think he can summarize it any better in their creeds? Christ says they worship in vain, teaching the doctrines for teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. What is it these Pharisees were saying? They were talking about washing their hands, or rather that the disciples of Christ were not washing their hands before they ate. They taught that the worship of God was in doing these things. They would not have stopped at washing of hands had the disciples did, you know, if they had washed their hands, they wouldn't have stopped there. They would have went on to something else because they were about washing everything. What they were doing, in fact, was replacing the law of God with their own law. The fact is they did not even keep their own law, let alone the law of God. But they changed the law of God to suit their desires. Is there anything wrong with washing your hands before you eat? There is if you do it thinking it will in some way make you clean before God in any way. This washing of hands is not the only things they washed or they had traditions to wash. Just about, just about everything they had this tradition for. Mark 7, 8 says, For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other, other such like things ye do. They washed cups and pots and tables. All of this with the mindset that it is somehow sanctifying them. <clears throat> Most of us wash our hands before we eat. Most of us wash, wash pots and pans and dishes. It makes for a sanitary and clean environment in this world, but not before God. When those who see you not walking according to their creed, they will find fault. If they are looking for fault in us, it is not hard to find. The fault is there. But the fault they think they find in us is not the real fault we have. The fault they find in, in us is that we are not doing those things which they think we should be doing to set us apart. This is according to their creeds and traditions. What does Christ tell them? And notice the Lord of glory goes to Scripture. These men go to their creeds or tra traditions, but the Lord of glory goes to the Scripture. I think to follow what Christ and what, what he said and what he does is a good thing, don't you? Yeah. Mark 7, 6, he says, this is Christ speaking. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Amen. But they tried to pass off their own tradition as God's law. Man's traditions, that is man's commandments, because this is what the word means used here, traditions means commandments, the creeds that men have are the very same thing as what these Pharisees were doing. What does Christ tell them? They were transgressing the law of God, and that would be the Ten Commandments, by their tradition. This is what happens with the tr traditions, creeds, or anything else that you set up of, as some kind of guide as to the walk of a believer. Men write things, and we are thankful for that. We read articles of some men. We read books they have, that have been written. But the child of God, when they read these things, they look at these things through the lens of the Scripture, if you will. And I mean by that, they try the spirits and look to see if what is being said is in the Scripture. So the Scripture is their rule. This tells them whether this spirit is of God or not. Are they saying what God's Word is saying? Not the other way around. 
They will have in these creeds a lot of good things and a lot of good statements that do in fact agree with Scripture. But this is their device. They make it sound good and then they throw in things like, you must be circumcised. That's what happened in Galatia. It was a very dangerous thing. Paul told them he was afraid of them. What that means is Paul was afraid that what he thought had been a work of God in them at the beginning may have not been God at all. This is what he was afraid of. It was concerning to him and it ought to be of concern to us when we start hearing things that man wants to add to Christ. But men hold up these, th these types of things, traditions and creeds, as if they are inspired of God and they are not. They command, the command our Lord went to was really not uh, dealing with cleansing or washing of hands directly anyway. He spoke of their transgression of, the, of God's law by their tradition of honoring their father and mother. I think the following is what is meant uh, that was said in verses 4, 5, and 6. Let's just go ahead and read that, 4, 5, and 6. In Matthew 15, for God commanded saying, honor thy father and mother and he that curses, curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me and honor not his father or mother, his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. And I think what is being said here is instead of taking care of their parents like they were supposed to, they were saying, I'm offering this or doing this with my money, and it's, it's, this is for you, for the parents, and so they don't have to take care of their parents. And I'm sure for these Pharisees and scribes, it benefited them in some way that the, the money or whatever it was they did back then to take care of their parents, you know, they just... They did this as an excuse not to take care of their parents. That's what it was. Now, regardless of what exactly was meant by their tradition, there's one thing very clear about it. It transgressed the law of God. Christ says so. God's commandments have no give. You either honor your father, father and mother or you will die. In not honoring them, you are in fact cursing them. Christ says, you shall die the death. This is their speech. This is the language of these Pharisees. And I, as I said, they still exist today. What they espouse when it comes to God's law is a following of God's commandments in a way that were never intended by God. The law was not given to us that we might keep it. The law entered that sin might abound. Abound. It would get worse. These blind leaders of the blind are all about man's work or man's doing and not God's doing. In their traditions or their creeds uh, said what, if their traditions or creeds said what God's word says, they would go to the scripture and not their tradition or creed. What value is it to go somewhere else if what is being said is in God's Word? The opposite is also true. If what is being said is not in the Scripture, what value is it to go to that which is being said? Now, I fully realize they do not say that what is in their creeds is not in Scripture. But I just read you what Scripture says about the law and why it is given. If they can get you to hold to their creed and use that as the basis for walk, then you cannot question them in what they are saying. Christ tells us they are hypocrites, and they themselves do not do what they tell you to do, and do not do what God tells them to do. Matthew 23, verses 2 through 7 we read, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not do ye after their works. For they say and do not. For they, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. 
but by all but all their works they do for to be seen of men they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at, at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men rabbi rabbi what they do is give lip service to god that is what we read in our text Verses 8 and 9 of Matthew 15. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. There is a reason why they are like this, and there is a reason why we are like this. There are some who want to hear this truth, but those who hold forth their traditions or creeds as God's word do not want to hear this. So what kind of speech is it that they do not want to hear? That which goeth into the mouth defileth not a man, but that which cometh out of the heart. They do not want to hear that man is as bad as he can be. He cannot get any worse, and he's not going to get any better. This flesh I'm talking about. This flesh will never improve. God has never intended to improve upon this flesh. God tells us in His Word that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Just like grace and works, there is no mixing the two. It's like this. I think Walter did it one time. Like this. Not like this. It's like this. They're totally opposed. They can't cannot come together in any way. <clears throat> One of the biggest reasons why they do not want to hear this kind of speech is because this leaves them in a place where they can do nothing of themselves. It leaves it all up to God to change this and to sustain this because the leper cannot will to change his spots. What does Christ tell Peter in Matthew 15, 19, and 20? For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. The real problem with man is his heart is only evil continually. Man as he is born in Adam will never do anything to improve this heart. A man or a woman who has, has not been given faith will not improve on this heart, but also no believer who has been given faith will ever improve this heart. We are told by the Spirit of God that we must deaden or that is mortify our members. This all being done by His Spirit. The real problem is that without God we can do nothing. We are not going to work any works worthy of God. Therefore, we will not work any work to save ourselves. If we are to perform any good works, it will be by His power. His power that works in us both the will and to do of His good pleasure. But not this flesh. As we have seen, the model of good works is this. Bowing down at Jesus Christ's feet shedding tears and wiping his feet with those tears and anointing him, or that is giving him honor, praise, and glory in total submission to him. But we are also told in Scripture that without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 5, and 6 we read, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. The heart we have is what? Deceitful above all things. Yes and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I heard someone say that a believer is not as bad as we can be. That is not a correct statement at all. The believer is absolutely righteous before God. 
But his flesh is as bad as it can be, and it will manifest itself if God does not enable you to mortify it by his spirit. So what do I do? What is it that will clean the inside of the cup, if you will? We read right here, although it may not be apparent at first, but we read the remedy of the problem right here in verse 13. Verse 13, I read it, I think. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Now this is in the negative, but here's what this verse is saying, and I'm going to interpret it scripture with scripture. John 6, 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. The word for planted there in verse 13 means to instill doctrine. He is the husbandman, and he dresses and keeps what is his. All those who are not his, he will clean out of the garden, if you will. God will get all the weeds out the ones that are of no value. We have this issue with this old Adamic heart which will never change. Notice when it says here in this passage in in verse 18. Let's read that. Verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. It does not say unless God fixes it up or until God fixes it up. God nowhere says he is going to fix up our old heart. He must give a new heart. This new heart being that new man which is created in true holiness. Ephesians 4.24 And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We all know here what the remedy is. I mean, we know that here. We hear it all the time here by God's grace in By his grace, it will continue to be heard here and repeated over and over again. Jesus Christ is the remedy for a fallen sinner who is an offense and an abomination in the sight of God as he is born. It is by the faith of Jesus Christ that any fallen son or daughter of Adam will ever be able to please God. Because of what he did, we are made the righteousness of God in him. We are righteous in Jesus Christ, but God will clean the inside of these pots. We are saved by grace through faith, and that, that is the grace, the salvation, the faith is all a gift of God. I know I have said this a lot lately, but I'm going to keep saying it because it's, it's not irksome or slothful, and it's safe to say these things over and over again. It is the faith of Christ and him having that faith, knowing what he was to do to please God the Father, that is to be the perfect sacrifice which would satisfy God once for all time, that justice which the law demands, he was set to satisfy that demand, which is this, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Christ was promised or was given of the Father a people for his name and this from before the foundation of the world. By his work, by his effort, by his cleansing, our debt is paid. Then in him we are made clean before God. We by what he did were made righteous, made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 We were made that righteousness which is without the law. We are totally, absolutely righteous before God, although I don't much feel like I am. But God says I am. I believe God. Hebrews 10, 14 we read, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Jesus Christ has accomplished the sanctification of those for whom he died for. What else about those who Jesus Christ has done this for, though? They don't just wake up one day in heaven and wonder how they got there. Christ tells us that you must believe that Jesus Christ is or you will die in your sins. 
So what are we told in 1 John 3 about those who God does a work for in time based on his work on the cross? 1 John 3, verses 7 through 9. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteous, righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. There is a birth that takes place. That one who has been given the new heart, Life before God, conceived by God. But that one is then birthed forth in believing by faith when God sends them his word, his gospel. So this new man does does this so this new man, does this new man created by God then begin to keep God's law, the Ten Commandments, as a way of life, or maybe even these traditions of men? The scripture is quite clear. The law does not give righteousness. The law does not give life. God gives life. The law entered that, this, that sin might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. No, it does not mean that we begin to keep God's law. It does not mean the new man as a believer begins to walk after the law as his way of life. Colossians 3, 4 we read, When Christ who is our life, shall appear, yes. then shall ye also appear with him in glory. It means he believes God, and in believing God he fulfills that law, because love is the fulfillment of the law. Scripture teaches us this, and if anyone says any different, if anyone begins to tell you you are to follow anything else other than Jesus Christ, they are blind. Yeah. Yeah. Do not follow them. This will lead you into the pit. But this new man created by God has a new heart. This new man has eyes to see. This new man has ears to hear. All created and given by God. This new man is given a faith. The faith of Jesus Christ. And in hearing the gospel that God also sends... And he does this through his sent messenger. We then see Jesus Christ in the gospel and we believe him. 2 Timothy 1.10 we read, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And that life and immortality is Jesus Christ. We do not see life in the law in any way, shape, or form. We see life in the gospel because it speaks of Jesus Christ. The gospel is not God enables me to keep his law. That's, that's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ and him crucified, of which Paul said he was determined not to know anything else among them. Works of this flesh, and if you are intending on trying to keep the law of God, the Ten Commandments, it will be this flesh that is involved in that because the law was not of faith. The works of the law are the works of the flesh. Galatians 3, 2 and 3, we've seen this before. This only what I learn of you, received ye the spirit of the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? We must believe Jesus Christ and it is that for which God gives us that enables us to believe that is counted for righteousness yes. because it is of Christ. Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And Walter's already said this before again, but I'm going to say it again. We are accounted righteous because it is there to account. Because He's given it to us. Given by God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Yes, Romans 9, 30-33 we read, What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? 
But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not obtained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Amen. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If there's anyone who talks to you and they are telling you Jesus Christ is not enough, they are blind. Yeah. Salvation is not of the works of man. Does that mean a man who is given life of God does not work? No, he does work. But he works to rest. Rest where? In Christ. Amen. Dear Lord God, thank you for allowing us to be here today, dear Lord. All things are of you. Forgive us of our sins, dear Lord, our shortcomings. There are too many to even number, dear Lord. Thank you for what you sent your son to take care of those sins, to, to pay the debt, the penalty that we owe, dear Lord. <clears throat> Open our hearts, minds, hearts, and ears, dear Lord, that we may attend to the words spoken of those who proclaim your gospel, no matter where, whether it's here or it's elsewhere, dear Lord. May it, may it be that we attend to those things that are of Christ. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.